What purpose then does the law serve? It was added because of transgressions, till the seed should come to whom the promise was made, and it was appointed through angels by the hand of a mediator. Now a mediator does not mediate for one only, but God is one. Galatians 3.19 and 20 Mediation is at the heart of the plan of God. Mediation is God providing us with a go-between, a substitute, to make peace between us and Him, to remove the hostility arising from sin which acts as a barrier separating man from God ever since the fall of Adam and Eve, Ephesians 2.14-18. through 18. We human beings are hopeless and helpless, thrice dead, possessing a sin nature from birth, sinning ever thereafter, and mortal bound for the lake of fire absent miraculous divine intervention. From birth, we were all thus in desperate need of a deliverance only God could provide. Nothing we could ever do, no human works, would ever be sufficient to mollify God's wrath for our sins and sinfulness. Indeed, at the last judgment, unbelievers will be condemned on the basis those very works that is, the human good they thought to do to propitiate God in the same vein as Cain, Revelation 20.11-15. through 15. But all such sacrifices are abominable to God. Only a perfect sacrifice which removed all of our sins could ever be sufficient. None of us could accomplish that, and God cannot have any contact with sin. What we needed was a third party to come between us and to make peace between us by providing that perfect sacrifice. What we needed was a perfect mediator, a perfect priest, who would be capable of offering the sacrifice which would propitiate the demands of God's perfect character which called for judgment on all human sin. What we needed was someone to reconcile us to God, to make peace between us and Him by removing the barrier of sin which divided us. What we needed was Jesus Christ. But God commends His love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So how much more is it not true now, after we have been rendered righteous through faith in His blood, that we shall be saved from the coming wrath through Him? For if when we were His enemies we were reconciled to God through the death of His Son, how much more is it not true now, since we have been reconciled to Him through Jesus' death, that we will be saved by His life? And not only that, but we even flaunt our new relationship with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have obtained this reconciliation. Romans 5, 8-11 through 11. And all things come from God who reconciled us to Himself through Christ, and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, for that God was and is in Christ, making overtures of reconciliation between the world and Himself, not taking their transgressions into account, and has entrusted us with this message, literally, word, of reconciliation. As ambassadors of Christ, as though God were urging you through us, we beg you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. 2 Corinthians 5, 18-20 For Jesus himself is our peace, for he has made both Jews and Gentiles one, and has broken down the middle wall of partition that is, the enmity, by discharging the law of the commandments and its requirements with his own body, so that he might recreate the two into one new man by making this peace, and might reconcile both in one body to God through his cross, having by means of it abolished the enmity between God and mankind. For when he had come, that is, the first advent, he proclaimed the gospel of peace to you who were far away from God, and peace to those who were near. For it is through Him that we both have our access to the Father by means of one Spirit. Ephesians 2.14-18 through 18. This is what our true high priest did for us, not merely portraying these blessed truths symbolically as the Levitical high priest did, but actually saving us by dying for our sins. This all being the case, how offensive to the Lord must it be when believers turn back from such inimitable grace to the works of their own hands instead, insulting the incomparable sacrifice of Jesus Christ by suggesting that their own efforts are superior. That is what the Jerusalem believers were doing in returning to the now defunct law. Gifts and Sacrifices Under the law, there were many different types of gifts and sacrifices offered for a variety of purposes and on a variety of occasions. For example, the first seven chapters of the book of Leviticus are devoted exclusively to these issues. 
although this is by far not the only place in the Pentateuch or the rest of the Old and New Testaments where these matters are discussed. The law, properly understood, is entirely symbolic of heavenly things, as Paul will point out later on in Hebrews. For if Jesus were on earth, he would not be a priest, since there are priests who offer the gifts according to the law, who serve the copy and shadow of the heavenly things, as Moses was divinely instructed when he was about to make the tabernacle. For he said, See that you make all things according to the pattern shown you on the mountain. Exodus 25.40 Hebrews 8, 4 and 5 Where gifts and sacrifices are concerned, without exception, these are meant to symbolize some aspect of Jesus' perfect person and his sacrifice for us on the cross, dying for the sins of the world. The next day John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. John 1.29 in general, all of the offerings presented under the law can be broken down into the two categories which Paul gives us here, gifts and sacrifices. Gifts represents the Hebrew word category, mincha, literally meaning, lexicographers surmise, a present. A mincha, broadly speaking, refers to anything given which was then intended to be used or consumed mainly by the priests, and it usually meant offerings of grain. Leviticus 2, 1 through 16 and 6, 14 through 23. Sacrifices, on the other hand, represents the Hebrew word category korban, literally meaning something brought near, that is, to the altar for sacrifice. In essence, a korban refers to anything dedicated to the Lord and marked for death by sacrifice. Leviticus 1, 2 through 17 and 3, 1 through 6, 13. Of course, the above simplifies the particulars greatly. The precise procedures to be followed in all of these offerings was and remains a matter of great interest to students of the law. 11. The point that we need to keep in mind here, and in all the discussions of particulars of the law coming up later in Hebrews, is the one made above. Every single aspect of the law was symbolic, and in one way or another was meant to reference Jesus Christ, his perfect person, and his efficacious sacrifice for us. 12. This symbolism may be seen with great clarity in the very first sacrifice established by the law, namely, the Passover, Exodus 12. 1 through 29. Numbers 9. 1 through 14. Deuteronomy 16, 1 through 8, and Ezekiel 45, 21 through 25. Then they shall eat the flesh of the lamb on that night, roasted in fire, with unleavened bread, and with bitter herbs they shall eat it. Exodus 12, 8. Passover, as we have seen in the past, is the precursor of our communion, where the elements are different today, bread and wine which require no blood sacrifice or elaborate preparation, but still symbolically represented faith in the person and the work of Christ, for example, John 1.29 and 136. Today, drinking the wine represents our faith in the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, the blood of Christ, that is, which covers our sins, coming from our substitute who died for us, while eating the bread represents our faith in his perfect person the sinless God-man who was fit and acceptable to be our substitute and to bear the sins of the world. In both cases, eating and drinking represent our acceptance by non-meritorious faith of these eternal truths of the gospel. That is, there is nothing meritorious about eating and drinking, but these actions do represent acceptance and taking in of what is offered to us. On the other hand, participating in rituals without understanding is worse than not participating at all, and worst of all is participating in rituals whose symbolism runs contrary to the truth we profess to believe. Jesus had already died for their sins, so that going back to the Jewish rituals which proclaimed a saviour yet to come, as opposed to communion which represents his work for us already completed, was a terrible scandal in the true etymological sense of the word a stumbling block to others who might be led into participation in this hypocrisy. Compare 1 Corinthians 8. 10. 
For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death, already accomplished, till he comes. 1 Corinthians 11.26